My name is Anita Kelly, and I'm the children's librarian here at the San Pedro Branch Library. I'm here to welcome you to today's LA Made program, Misty Copeland, author of Black Ballerinas, My Journey to Our Legacy. Hello, I'm Angela Romero, a local historian who has spent over 10 years studying the history and culture of San Pedro, California, a harbor community within the city of Los Angeles. I continue to explore and keep the conversation going of San Pedro history through walking tours, a monthly column in San Pedro Today magazine, podcasts, and my latest endeavor, the San Pedro Heritage Museum. Are you excited, Angela? So excited. <laughs> Me too. Okay. Um, so before we move forward with today's program, uh, we would like to pay our respects and acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territories of the Tongva, Chumash, Fernandino, Tataviam, and Peach tribes that is now occupied by Los Angeles. We recognize and acknowledge the first people of this land honor their elders past and present and the descendants who are citizens of these nations. For more information on which territory you may reside on, check out native-land.ca. We'd also like to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Library Foundation, and the behind the scenes staff for helping bring the LA Made and your author programs to you virtually. We want to thank our generous donors, the Lenore S. and Bernard A. Greenberg Fund, and the Library Foundation for helping the library bring these amazing author and illustrator programs. LA Made focuses on the diverse landscape of Los Angeles, highlighting the immense artistic and performance talent that has developed in the course of the city's eclectic history. If you would like to see more of our amazing programs, please visit our online calendar at lapl.org events. And for our LA Made program visit, uh, LAPL.org slash LA Made or the Your Author programs at LAPL.org slash Your Author. That was a mouthful. <laughs> um, the website also has blog posts and video links that highlight the library's diverse resources and upcoming programs. Okay, but now on to today's program. Uh, Misty Copeland made history by becoming the first African American female principal dancer at the American Ballet Theater. She has performed some of the most iconic classical ballet roles, roles including Odette Odile in Swan Lake, Juliet in Romeo and Juliet, Giselle, Menon, Coppelia, I may have said that wrong, Kitri and Don Quixote, and Firebird, to name a few. Misty is the best-selling author of Life in Motion, Black Ballerinas, My Journey to Our Legacy and Ballerina Body. And I have her newest book, Black Ballerinas, here as well as an award-winning picture book author, Firebird. She is the recipient of the Lenore Annenberg Fellowship in the Arts and inductee into the Boys and Girls Club Alum Alumni Hall of Fame. As a reminder, participants at today's program will have a chance to win a free copy of Black Ballerinas, My Journey to Our Legacy. All you have to do to enter is just email ecdept at lapl.org for your opportunity to win. And now let's welcome to our LA Made stage, Missy Copeland. Yay! Hi. You said it right. Missy. I you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, so I'm so excited to be here. It's like a homecoming. I it it means everything to me to be back like in the community, giving back to my community because I wouldn't be where I am or who I am without Pedro, without LA, without California. So Awesome. Thank you for mentioning Pedro first, because uh, <laughs> I want to get the, the Pedro elephant out of the, room, out of the way first. I'm a Pedro <laughs> historian, Ednita is the Pedro librarian, and you are the pride of Pedro. Oh. So can you can you list off your Pedro pedigree for us, which is just all the like, yeah. little local schools and like yes. and affiliations you have? Well, you know what's so, before I, I do my list, um, you know, I actually was having this conversation with my husband recently. Um, my family did so much moving around. I was actually born in Kansas City, Missouri. We moved to Los Angeles when I was two. And I lived a whole bunch of places that I literally have no memory of. 
which is crazy. And my first memories were built um, starting at Point Furman Elementary School. Like that's when I really, like that was the first place that I felt uh, like home became home for me. I was seven years old. And um, and then that was it. That, that was my home. But it was Point Furman Elementary School. I went to Dana Middle School. Of course, the Boys and Girls Club, some future Boys and Girls Clubs. It was like right across the street, like right down the street from Dana and then and then San Pedro High. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So I love this book is amazing. Thank and how long, how long did it take you to compile all of this, all of these stories? You know, I I actually wrote the physically wrote the book like within I don't know like seven months or something. But this has been twenty years of research. Like I've been a professional with American Ballet Theater for twenty years, and you know th th these dancers are not people you can just Google and 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 learn about uh, the accomplishments, especially you know, the older black dancers. Um, so this has been my life's work, I feel like. Like if I have seven books, this is my seventh book. And, and this is like my pride and joy because I feel like it's been, you know, a career journey of trying to figure out, understand, um, you know, the lineage that I'm a part of as a black woman in ballet, which is not documented. It's not talked about. You don't see it in ballet history books and it was like we need our we need to write our history which is most the case you know mostly the case for for black americans is that we end up doing it ourselves because it's not something that's readily available uh so 20 years of research but it's like been word of mouth of meeting black dancers throughout my career learning about other black dancers through them and and um and it continues, you know, this is just a small portion of, of the community that has existed um, throughout, you know, for hundreds of years. And um, this is just a small fraction of, of dancers who affected me, have been a part of my life, but by no means, this is not a comprehensive list. Um, I have a question. So I started reading um, the junior edition of Life in Motion that you wrote. And in it, you talk about how anxious you were to start learning ballet. And I'd like to know what having a book like Black Ballerinas would have, what difference that would have made for you um, if you could have walked into the San Pedro Library perhaps and found this book on, on our shelves and checked it out. Absolutely. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, I'm fortunate that I do come from a community that's diverse. And my fear was going into ballet. I didn't feel a connection to it. I think that was what, what my, where my anxieties and fears came from. Uh, I, for the most part, was the only brown girl, the only black girl in my class. And, um, and I didn't really, you know, I didn't grow up hearing classical music. I didn't really understand how I would fit into that. So definitely having a book like this, I think would have given me a little bit more perspective and context as to how I might fit in, but also the fact that it sh ballet should be shared as in an equal opportunity environment. You know, it should be available to anyone who wants to be a part of it. Um, there's, it's about telling stories about, it's about um, having the experience of live performance and it shouldn't be, um, you know, inclusive in a way that that takes away from a whole community. Um, so I, I wish I would have had a book like this growing up for sure. Absolutely. It's such a great addition to, like you said, the history. It's like a beginning. It's an introduction. And you've introduced these stories, the beautiful artwork that have just really, I think, heightened all of these artists into like not only are they artists but their life is a work of art because Absolutely. now they've been but uh the other thing you introduce which i think is extremely important is uh a co you introduce like a coded language that a hmm. lot of these black ballerinas have to um that are kind of at the heart of the struggle of being a black ballerina where it's Absolutely. like 
blending and distraction. How important is it for young black dancers to like know this language? Yeah, I mean, I think that I think innately, if you're a part of the ballet world in particular as a black dancer, you know it. I just don't know that you can, it's something that you understand and can decipher and, and understand why the the language is so uh, exclusive. It, you know, it makes you feel that you're not a part of it. There's so many microaggressions. And I, that's something that I had to like figure out on my own. Um, you know, it, it becomes this natural part like of what's expected in the ballet world, um, you know, where, you know, I think about, in, in modeling or, you know, where it's about your aesthetic. So people can decide what their preference is because it's, you know, it's, it's supposed to be um, a subjective form. Um, so I think that's kind of been in a way how ballet has gotten away with being, um, you know, s s not inclusive, but uh, it's been, it was important for me to step back instead of, uh, having this like self-hate that I think a lot of black and brown dancers end up having by being a part of an art form like this. Um, step back and like be really grounded and realistic about what's going on around me. So, you know, as a young girl coming into the company and I'm being told, well, your, your bust is too big, your muscles are too big, you know, you're too short, all of this. And I'm looking at the girls, the white girls next to me who have the same build or are bigger. And I'm like, this, these two things don't add up. <laughs> like there's some, there's something else here that's making them, you know, not want me um, or feel that I'm, I'm not uh, the, you know, the right aesthetic and it's the color of my skin. And so that's something that I've been very candid about and, and spoken about, about very openly because I think it's important for uh, people to realize that, you know, these are, these are issues that we have to address. Um, can I ask, when did you figure out that that's what that was, those microaggressions? Like, you know, cause it's not like you had fellow black dancers to be like, oh girl, you know, the reason why they're doing that is because you're black. Like, so how did you not be gaslit and think, oh, it actually is because of my body and realize it's because of race? I think it's a bit a combination of things. Like I'm so grateful for um, my late start in ballet, and I think a lot of people would think the opposite <laughs> um, that that are, there were a lot of challenges. I mean, I started at 13, and I noticed some people that maybe don't know the ballet where they're like, "Well, that's still really young." <laughs> but in terms of ballet, you know, the point is to really get the body before it's fully formed. Like it's full, you've hit puberty, all of those things, be able to shape and mold the muscles and it becomes second nature. A lot of training and, and um, you know, reps that go into the training to get to where you are as a professional. Um, and I think something I'm grateful for is that I, I didn't have the mentality of a lot of ballet dancers after, you know, I only trained for four years. Um, which is extremely short before becoming a professional dancer. So I feel like I had a different grasp on, um, on like reality, <laughs> you know, where it was kind of like I wasn't so caught up in the ballet bubble of, of conforming. And so I feel like it, it, I had a bit more of a realistic uh, like identity um, as like a black woman, as well as having an amazing support system. Like, even though I didn't have, you know, I was the only black woman at ABT for the first decade of my career, I still, I had black women outside of the company that were supporting me. Not all of them were, were classical dancers, but, you know, that were, you know, leaders and bosses in their own right in whatever it is they did. And just to have that perspective, um, I felt like I wasn't so like caught up in the ballet bubble. <laughs> That makes sense. Yeah. Community is such a great thing. It's amazing. Absolutely. I well, There was another thing that kind of struck me in reading all these stories was uh, that several of the ball ballerinas decided to uh, go to Europe and said, can you just explain like how black dancers are perceived in, in Europe? It's so fascinating, <laughs> um, you know, and I think you can like trace this back to, you know, even I, you know, I'm i working on a project about Marian Anderson right now. And 
Um, she was the first black opera singer to perform at the Metropolitan Opera House at Lincoln Center. Um, and like, she was this huge superstar over in Europe, um, you know, in, in, in like the forties and, uh, so many black artists went to Europe to, because they're more accepting and, um, it's just, it's very interesting, but I mean, the same goes for classical dancers. There's so many dancers on this list that, uh, had trouble getting into elite companies because of the color of their skin. Um, especially when you're dealing with touring companies who toured through the South, you know, uh, in, in, in that time. Um, and so a lot of them left and, and went to Europe to have more fruitful careers. Um, you know, even to this day, I think about Michaela de Prince, who's a young dancer. She's in her early 20s and she experienced the same thing. She went through the American Ballet Theater School, insane talent, and they didn't take her into this company. Um, so she ended up moving to Europe and um, and starting her career there. Um, it's sad, but we have a long way to go still um, in America, in the ballet world. My goodness. Um, I have a question. So you talk about a lot of the dancers that you cover who their careers weren't documented. And so I can imagine as you were doing your research, you ran into roadblocks. Um, and <laughs> yeah, you know, where you couldn't, you just simply couldn't find information. And so I'd like to know, did you have to leave people out because there, there just wasn't mm -hmm. anything there? Um, I didn't leave anyone out because I couldn't find research. I mean, this this was so difficult to do. I I was only given a certain number of pages, you know, for this book, and um, I actually at the last minute I like begged, like, please can I add one more dancer? Um, <laughs> it was Marion Sujet who I ended up adding, who was such an incredible link to all of these stories. That I thought was so vital, um, but I would say that. Again, you know, in the same way that I did this 20 years of research uh, with this book, um, it was word of mouth and talking to other dancers. That's really how, you know, I didn't want, uh, I didn't want to interview dancers that are still alive. I didn't want to interview anyone for this. I really wanted it to be my perspective, um, how I experience them, how I view, how I see how they're affecting the ballet world. Um, but I did have to send some texts to people. Lorraine Graves is one of them, who was an incredible ballerina at Dance Theater of Harlem. And um, there was just so little information on her. And luckily, I have relationships with a lot of these women. So I could, you know, call up Lorraine or text her and just say, like, this is not at all clear on anything I can find. When did you join the company? Like, how old were you? When were you promoted? And she could give me some more insight or even on other dancers. So it, you know, within the time of writing the book, I kind of went about it the same way I have throughout my career with just like uh, leaning on on these black women, the ones that are still with us and, and hearing their stories from them. The Raven Wilkinson one made me cry so hard. <laughs> that, you know, Ravens, I had to, I had to like cut it in half because it was so long and I'm like, these have to be ballads. Um, and actually my next book that I'm working on right now is about Raven, um, solely, uh, you know, focusing on her story. And she's, um, I mean, she was a huge mentor of mine. And though, you know, I knew about other black dancers uh, before I learned of her story, there was something about knowing of her existence, like in her time, like similar to Marian Anderson, um, who was really so isolated in, in, in the company that she was in. She was with the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo in the 1950s. And this was like one of, you know, the first classical companies in America. And it was an elite white company with, you know, dancers from all over the globe that came together and they, they toured through America. And um, she was the only black woman and learning of her story and hearing just the, her perseverance and her strength. She was another one that went off to Europe after some time with the Ballet Russe here in America and um, the KKK were threatening her life. So she ended up moving to, uh, to Europe to finish out her career there. 
Um, but what she meant to me, she gave me like this second wind to to know that like if she can get through that like this none of this should be a problem i should have the strength to be able to like pull it together lean on my mentors and you know do everything i can to make the most of, of this career and opportunity um before we start opening it up to the public's questions i did have a, a few questions about um your career goals when you were younger. <laughs> um, I'd love to know, seeing that you've written seven books already and you're, you've already said you're working on another one, um, I'd love to know what you wanted to be when you were a kid before you knew you were going to be a ballerina. Yeah, I mean, when I was, so my mother was back in Kansas City. She was a professional cheerleader for the Kansas City Chiefs football team. And, um, she grew up dancing, nothing serious, uh, but knowing, like seeing that that type of background, like I was a little bit drawn to it. I didn't know that much about it. But then, um, you know, I, I kind of shifted, but a lot of it was all focused in, in the performing arts, which is just crazy because I wasn't really exposed to it um, at all. And I think it was at the end of my time at Point Furman, um, my sister, my eldest sister, Erica, was on the drill team of Dana's, Dana Middle School drill team. And they were like winning all these competitions. And so that became like, I, I want to be on the drill team. Like that was like my goal. Like I want to, I want to enter in that, into that type of, you know, field. And my whole family was just shocked because I was so introverted and I showed no interest at all in wanting to be on a stage. I didn't want to speak. So they were like, I don't think you understand what this entails. Like you're going to be on a stage performing in front of people. And I was like, no, I want to do this. And I want to audition for captain, not just like the drill team, but captain. So I don't, there was something in me that, you know, it was calling me towards that. So, you know, there was never anything really like academically. Um, you know, I was a good student, but there was nothing that really sparked my interest. And then, you know, from Dana, Dana's drill team, that's literally how I found ballet through, through the coach Elizabeth Cantine at the time, who then introduced me to the boys, to a teacher at the Boys and Girls Club, Cynthia Bradley. And the rest is history. <laughs> the rest is history. Um, but I, then, never had any, I never had any dreams of being a writer, yeah, um, you know, anything like that. And, and um, you know, I feel like it was another tool and way of, for me ex of expressing myself. Movement was, and then writing became that. I started writing in journals from a young age, and it was like everything I couldn't say, I would write. And I'm so fortunate I had that because for my memoir, I literally have stacks of journals from like a really young age that I could draw on. I was wondering how you could be so detail oriented because you are. And when I started the um, junior version, I had to switch to the adult version because I'm like, oh, I know she's leaving stuff out here. So <laughs> um, I, love it. I had a follow up question to that, what you wanted to be when you were a little kid. Um, if you couldn't be a ballerina, what could you see yourself mm -hmm. doing? Anything. What could you see yourself doing? Um, something creative, but I, I love being in the kitchen. I love to cook. I, I feel like it's like another amazing artistic outlet of like expression that's not nearly as physical as what I do. And you get to eat it at the end. So I would say like a chef or something. Are we going to get a Misty Copeland cooking book? I know, right? Well, I mean, ballerina bodies I, ballerina body, I, I, there's a portion of it that has a lot of my recipes oh. and stuff like that in it. So you get a, a little taste of, of that side of me in that book. <laughs> cool. So you were talking about um, being exposed and you felt like, you know, ba ballet wasn't really uh, something that was accessible to you. What's the best way for black kids to be exposed to ballet to create more black dancers? Um, you know, I really think it's about like there is there are books available. You can go on YouTube, which I didn't have <laughs> growing up, but you can go on YouTube and you can find videos and and learn about um, you know, so many legacies and and so many dancers who have paved the way for us today. 
Um, but, you know, also do research in your local communities. Like, there are programs out there and available like like the one I found through the Boys and Girls Clubs. Like I think about um, City Ballet of Los Angeles and I, I believe Robin Gardenhire might be here listening, who's an incredible teacher. Um, she opened up her school, but there's, there's a lot of opportunities um, for dancers of color to find support in people who um, who look like them. And that's such a vital part of, of um, getting nurturing young people of color from a from a young age, just having teachers, having people surround around them who reflect them, who they can see themselves through, so they feel comfortable and safe enough to um, to go further within this field. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think we're ready to move on to the public's questions. So we're going to see them on our screen. Um, I'll ask the first one and then we can just go back and forth, Angela. Um, why did you not start dance before 13 and what got you interested in the first place? I I mean, I didn't really know that ballet was even like an option. <laughs> that wasn't something that I I was was introduced to. Um, and and it was okay. If I'm being honest, it was it was music that drew me to dance initially. And Mariah Carey was such a huge part of that. Um, you know, a lot of, I mean, I grew up with a ton of music in my household, a lot of R&B and hip hop and, and pop music. And um, I remember it's actually embarrassing, but I auditioned as captain for the Dana drill team um, to George Michael's I Want Your Sex. I'm like, I don't know how they allowed that to happen. <laughs> I made captain. <laughs> But it was it was a lot of music that that drew me to dance and Mariah Carey. You know, I don't think that's something I really understood until I was older. That she, being a biracial woman, I connected to her and I saw someone who was succeeding and someone I could identify with. And I think that's why I was so drawn to her music. But um, that's what got me creating and choreographing was hearing music and then um, and then that drew me to drill team. Of course, having my mom and my sister as an example. Um, and then I was yanked out of drill team and pulled into ballet and I fell in love with it over time. Thank you. What advice do you have for other dancers starting out late who are looking to improve? You have to be patient. There's like no, there's not, there's no shortcuts, but it's also not, not a possibility. I am, I don't believe that there's like too late of an age to start. I think that if you find the right teachers um, that are going to be there to support you um, with like the proper training, make sure you're in the proper atmosphere, you have the right flooring, the right gear, um, I think anything is possible. Like when you have the right support system around you and as a professional, I have started over like so many times um, and, you know, with, with my training, like trying different things, finding different teachers and learning different techniques to make myself better. So I don't think that um, there's like a certain age you have to be or number of years you have to train, but I think you just have to be really focused and committed to what you're doing and really consistent in that. All right. Um, do you think you'll continue to write more books? I hope so. By yes. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, it, it's an ongoing thing. I feel like every time I, feel this like amazing accomplishment of like finishing a book the publisher is like all right what's next <laughs> i'm like oh okay so of course i mean i have more children's books that i'm working on um i've got uh like a sequel to bunheads my children's book that uh came out i think a year and a half ago um i'm already working on a new book about my mentor raven wilkinson that i'm in the midst of writing right now so that's definitely something that i will continue to do uh so this is from regina ritter misty thank you for putting san pedro on the map we're so proud now serious question favorite sandwiches in pedro Oh my God. I did not put San Pedro on the map, first of all, but I championed San Pedro all day because 
again, I wouldn't be here without that community and the support and love that I've gotten from, from, from San Pedro. Um, Busy B, um, <laughs> Busy B, the, the uh, meatball sub with provolone cheese. <laughs> That's my favorite sandwich in San Pedro. <laughs> Busy B is the best. Sorry, everyone else. It's the best. <laughs> okay. From Chloe Vargas. She says, I want to be a ballerina, but I don't know. I kind of get judged just by my body. Do you have anything to say to her? Again, I think going back to the, the last question, you know, about like starting late, I think it's important to be in an environment where you're going to be supported, where you're not going to be turned away because of the way that you look. I think everyone should have the opportunity to be exposed to dance and to the arts um, and have a fair chance. You know, it's about it's about the experience. It's about gaining the tools by being a part of the arts to go on to do whatever it is you want to do. Being a part of an art form makes you a, a, a better leader. It, it gives you perspective on like what it is to commit fully to something, to have that vigor and drive and commitment and dedication. So it's about finding a school where they're going to be open to accepting you for you and nurturing your, your talents. But um, it's about, you know, improving and loving yourself and experiencing the craft, not, not about being turned down because of the way you look. Okay, this is from Marilyn Marquez Smith. Was there something that shocked you to learn? Something that inspired you to keep going? Something that shocked me to learn. Hmm. Huh. I mean, I feel like I feel like I'm constantly, I'm I'm forever a student. And I and there's there's not I think the moment that I, and I don't think this day will ever come, I'm just going to get old and be like, I can't do this anymore. But like, <laughs> when I think like, oh, I've learned everything I can, that should probably be a time where I like should stop. But I don't, I can't imagine that ever happening. But um, there are often like challenges and, and, um, and things along the way that have pushed me. I think I think entering probably the biggest is was entering into ballet as a professional at 17 years old. I graduated from Bidro and I moved straight to New York City and started my professional career at 17. And I think it was just a shock, the, the realization of the lack of diversity. I think that that was really shocking for me. Um, and that was when I kind of had to take matters into my own hands and and do as much research as possible, which has brought me to this place in my journey and, and made me the ballerina I am and um, and brought me together with so many of these dancers who I stand on the shoulders of. Nice. Okay. Um, NWN asks, what is your favorite city to perform in? And are there particular cities that show you special love when you perform there? Oh, well, of course, when I'm in Cali, like the love is like unbelievable at the Seagrestrom Center for the Arts in Orange County and Costa Mesa. Whenever I'm there, like that's like the closest theater to like home. And, uh, you know, it's 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 fascinating to perform in theaters all over the world to get different responses because there's different cultures and different communities um, in in California and Southern California. Like they are not afraid to like scream and cheer. Like it's not like being at a theater in like Shanghai or Singapore. Um, but uh, outside of California, I would say I love to be in, in Asia. I love Tokyo. I love to be in Japan in those theaters. It's, it's a different response you get because they have a different culture and a different way that they show respect and, and love. And a lot of the times that's through silence. Um, but then you get to the stage door and they're like, treat you like you're a rock star and it's like insane. And they'll chase after the tour bus and you're like, what, where was this in the theater? But it's, it's really amazing to have the experience of like traveling the world. This is from Elise E. Who were your teachers oh. at Lawrence and Ballet Center? Oh my gosh. Um, well, Diane Lordson, of course, the founder of the studio, um, Alicia, 
Uh, oh my God, who else? Probably people who aren't there anymore because you looked very young in that picture. Charles Maple, <laughs> a lot of uh, Nancy. Well, she was I was older. Nancy teaches the little ones. Um, and you probably know Elijah, Diane's son. He actually was dancing with me, not really teaching that much yet. But um, I'm from a different generation. <laughs> Elizabeth. Oh. Like, you know, her. <laughs> um, she says she's Misty's drill team coach, now her godmother, who is so proud of her. I adore you. I mean, this this whole life, <laughs> you know, like none of this would be possible without the vision of that woman who you just saw on the screen, Elizabeth Cantine. Elizabeth saw, she was my, the drill team coach who, who, um, who saw potential in me and made me captain of the drill team uh, at 12 and a half years old. And then she's the same woman who said, I see so much potential in you. I think you should take ballet classes. And she sent me to the Boys and Girls Club to take classes with Cynthia Bradley and has never left my side. Um, you know, was a huge supporter financially, emotionally, in so many ways, um, you know, and, and to this day, and yes, she is my godmother and a huge part of my life and family. And one of the, you know, just an example of what it is to be a phenomenal teacher uh, who changes so many of her students' lives. Are you plant-based? <laughs> I have gone up and down um, with, with the way, like di again, the same way I was talking about the different things that I like to try in terms of my training and my technique. Um, I have was a pescatarian for eight years. Um, and then on one random New Year's Day, I woke up and I said, I want bacon. Um, <laughs> So I, I pretty much like I go with like how I'm feeling. I definitely eat healthy um, and listen to my body and and um, and what's best for me, especially when I'm in season and I'm training. But I wouldn't I'm not fully plant plant based. My husband is a, a much healthier eater than I am, and he's pretty plant based. <laughs> oh, somebody asks another food question. Elise does. What is your favorite food? Oh, it's so hard to to choose. Like, I love pizza, but I would say Mexican. I think also being from San Pedro, like having amazing Mexican food available, or just in California in general. Um, I love Mexican food. I love spicy and yeah. Was there ever a time you may have considered dropping out of ballet, given all of the gaslighting you endured? I'm so glad you didn't give up. I, thank you. Absolutely. And, and I think this is something that's so important to talk about. And I know that like mental health is such a huge topic, you know, today and not being ashamed of acknowledging and, um, and feeling that that's something that you should handle and take care of and, and let the people around you know what you're experiencing. Um, but I definitely had moments where, um, you know, it's hard. You don't feel like you fit in. Like for me, that was like, you know, such a big part of it in the beginning. And it made me want to give up. And it was reaching out to the people around me that were going to ensure me that though you don't see yourself reflected every day in the rooms that you're in, you belong here. Um, but I, I went to Dance Seat of Harlem after I was invited by um, Mr. Mitchell, who is the founder, um, because I was feeling like I didn't know that there would be a future for me at ABT. You know, it felt very lonely and I could go to Dance Seat of Harlem and be surrounded by black and brown dancers just like myself. Um, and it was it was being in that space that made me even more aware of what I could accomplish by staying with American Ballet Theater, um, by pushing the boundaries and, and, and feeling like I could give opportunity to other Black dancers if I just stayed focused and um, fought for what I thought I deserved. Andrea asks, Misty, can you talk about your first experience in a ballet class? Did you immediately take to it or did 
it takes some time. And how did being black during that affect your motivation early on? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I definitely didn't fall in love with it immediately. <laughs> I mean, I was on the drill team and I was like dancing to, you know, everything I want, like the music I was listening to, like it, you know, that was like social music. And I'd never heard classical ballet until I went in. Well, maybe Liz Elizabeth Canti might have been the first person that I heard classical music from um, on the drill team. But uh, I think what was hard for me when I took my first ballet class was that I was not in a in a conventional studio. I was at a, a boys and girls club on a basketball court in my gym clothes, in my PE clothes and socks. So I didn't feel like I like belonged. I was like a fish out of water. But once I was in the ballet studio and I got the tights and, and I had the ballet slippers and the leotard and I could see myself in a mirror and it was the first time I was being told like I was good at something and that I was right for something. And all the things that I felt made me ugly in the world, like being skinny and having long legs and big feet and this tiny little head, and I, they'd call me peanut, it's my little head, and having a long neck, all of these things that I felt made me ugly, made me beautiful in ballet. So it was like this turnaround of, um, you know, just feeling supported and, and confident um, in a way I never had. And I would say that, you know, the like being black was never something that was brought up to me that was an obstacle. And that I'm so fortunate for the, the teachers I had at, you know, the San Pedro Dance Center, which it was called then, um, because it, it was something that like Cynthia Bradley did a really incredible job of protecting me from knowing the realities of what were happening, which I learned as, as an adult, you know, a lot of students were, their parents were pulling them from the school because I was there and I was getting to lead, do lead roles and stop donating money to the school. But that was kept from me and it allowed me to have this freedom to be free and creative in that space. Like it was a safe space for me being in the dance studio. From Kathy Ellen Davis, my five-year-old Rosemary wanted to say you are the best belly dancer in the world. Well, I don't think that's true, but that's very, very, very sweet. And it's all subjective, I guess. <laughs> Carolyn asks, did you start out with just one dance class per week or did you dive in and start doing it every day at the beginning? Well, because I started at 13 years old and my goal immediately, the goal of, you know, everyone who was around me supporting me was for me to become a professional dancer. And um, that would mean that, you know, most professionals in, in elite top companies, in ballet companies, join companies between the ages of 16 and 20. So I didn't have a lot of time. So I dove right in. I was taking up to three ballet classes a day. I was 13 and um, I was taking beginner ballet with like five and six year olds. And then I would go take like an intermediate class and I would be thrown in to the advanced class and like figuring out how to survive. But um, I, I learned so much in such a short period of time. How did you maintain conditioning uh, during this pandemic? Um, it's been extremely difficult. Like there's no way around the fact that dancers have to be in a studio with the proper setting, the floor. If you're dancing on point, you have to have the right flooring if you want to jump. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen a lot of hilarious videos and dangerous videos on YouTube of people trying to dance in their apartments and homes during the pandemic. Um, but, you know, it was about working with what, you know, the space I had and, you know, whether it was doing Pilates, floor mat stuff, uh, floor bar classes, um, just things that you can control within your environment. And I feel like that's something I've always been good at is, is making, making the best out of the circumstances and, and surroundings I'm in. <laughs> Such a good question. Yeah. Um, uh, how do you, Jeep asks, um, how do you relax? Do you have any hobbies? Um, as much as I, I travel for work, I love to travel for like relaxation, <laughs> um, which has been so hard in the pandemic because I'm so used to traveling so much, but I love to just be somewhere warm 
and on a beach. Um, but also, like I was saying earlier, like cooking brings me so much joy and like being in the kitchen and creating in that way and, and feeling like you're like, you know, giving back to people that may be over, you know, your house and, and kind of taking care in that way. I, yeah, I would say cooking is a good relaxation hobby for me. This is from Amber. My eight-year-old Lila is glad to be listening to you and says she wants to be just like you when she grows up. Well, well thank you, Lila. <laughs> That's a good question. Being a dancer, being a dancer, how do I care for my feet? Thanks, sorry, I was on mute. I, I actually had that question too, so I'd love to know. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there are ways in which you can, you know, of course it's like, maybe not in the way most people think about it. Like I don't go get manicures and like if I have a shoot and, you know, there's like a, a manicurist on the um, on the set, I'm like, or I don't get pedicures. I'm like, do not touch my feet. I feel these little hands on my feet and I'm like, no, <laughs> like dancers work, especially women. Well, I would say men as well, you know, that build up calluses from dancing and moving that become our armor and our protection. And, um, you know, you get to a certain point where, you know, your toes are no longer bleeding like they are when you're younger and you first start training and dancing. It's because you're building up those calluses and, and all the, the good, good protection stuff uh, for your feet. So, um, you know, it's, it's about keeping your nails short, like just, I don't know, it's hard to explain a little gross, but <laughs> not, not trying to like, you know, take away any of those calluses, the things that people say like, oh, your feet are so ugly in ballet. It's like, that's beauty that you're proud to possess. I think that's fascinating. I don't think it's gross at all because the <laughs> thing that I was curious about is like, what types of shoes do you wear when you're not, you know, dancing or needing to be seen? And also yeah. like, do you stay off your feet when you're not training or you know, that's not something that's happened until more recently, just because I'm getting older. Um, but always throughout my life, like as a dancer, I'm like that girl that's in my in high heels and like what, you know, but now like the older that I've gotten and I've had so many injuries that, um, you know, that's like number one priority. But yes, I was that girl that was walking around in heels, taking the subway, like in New York City, like. I don't know how I did it. I mean, my legs were strong and I was like, I can do this. <laughs> but wow. now, but now it's like, you know, tennis shoes and just being smart about taking care of my body. And, um, you know, when you're walking around, like on concrete, you want to have something supportive with cushion and things to protect your bones and your back and all of that stuff. <laughs> okay. Uh, what kind of books do you like to read? Oh my God. I'm like, I've got so many up here, right? Now I need to, that I need to dive into. Um, I'm all over the place with what I, with what I love to read. I love like, you know, to dive into something as deep as like a Ta-Nehisi Coates book. Um, but then like I recently, what is this book? It's called Luster. She's a, a black author um, by Raven Leilani. I'm like, there's some young people on here. I wouldn't recommend it for you, but, <laughs> but I'm pretty like, you know, all over the place with, with, um, you know, experiencing different writers with different walks of life that come from different cultures and experiences. Um, yeah. <laughs> Elise asks, what was your worst injury and how did you come back from it? My worst injury, Elise has got all the good questions. Um, my, my worst injury was, um, God, I guess it was like about 10 years ago, almost now. Um, I had six stress fractures to my tibia, so on my shin. Uh, and I ended up having surgery. I had a plate screwed in, which is still in there. And uh, the recovery is, is still to this day. Like I haven't been the same dancer since. Um, and I'm actually supposed to have one of the screws removed um, in, in, in a little bit, uh, just to relieve some of the pressure that I'm still feeling like pain in that leg. So, you know, we're like football players and basketball players and hockey, like we get the same injuries, which is, you know, why dancers are often like, 
we are athletes, you know, yes, we are artists, but we train and our bodies go through so much. And, um, and it takes even more work and effort to make it look effortless. So. What, what was the first thing that made you consider becoming an author? Um, someone literally pushing me to do it. It again, it wasn't something that I ever thought like writing. I never thought it was something that I would share with people. Um, I was contacted, um, through like my, my, uh, fan, like fan mail, um, on, on my, um, website, like years and years ago, um, by a young editor at Simon and Schuster, who said, I think your story is so fascinating. We would love to talk to you about writing a memoir. And I just thought they were crazy. I mean, I I gave my manager the information. I was like, I don't know if this is real or not. Like, who's going to want to listen? <laughs> like, I have barely lived a life, I feel like. How am I going to write a memoir? And, um, and she reached out to them and they were serious. And I went and met with them. And this is like how the whole journey of being an author got started. But it was someone seeing, um, you know, potential in me and in my story. And, um, and I've just been so grateful and fortunate ever since. That was the perfect segue into um, my next question that I wanted to ask earlier. Um, so the book Black Ballerina is beautifully illustrated. There are no pictures of any ballerinas in here. It's all um, illustrations. And so we wanted to know, um, Selena Barnes, your illustrator, yes. did you ever get a chance to meet her? Um, and can you tell us anything about her? We have not met in person. She lives in Germany, um, but she is phenomenal. And, you know, I, I've, I've just been so fortunate to have the collaborators that I've had, collaborators that I've had throughout my time writing. Um, and it's always been important for me whenever I'm telling stories of especially Black people people, Black children, I really want it to be a reflection, a true reflection of who we are. And, and, and I think that, um, you know, with Selena, this was a very important book. I wanted each dancer to, uh, for you to feel their culture. And, you know, Black bodies have just been um, you know, there's such a negative connotation attached to it. Like you think about, you know, the Williams sisters and, and Gabby Douglas and just so many black women, especially and how their bodies are perceived and how negative it is. I wanted to have a black woman uh, illustrating, you know, these dancers in this book for it to be through the lens of a black woman. You know, I think that it, it came out in such a beautiful and positive way and i'm just so grateful for that collaboration oh uh, michelle <laughs> from elementary here we just read firebird last week what were some of your favorite books and authors to read growing up oh my gosh um you know one that i often talk about that sticks with me and i think there was just something about like feeling different um and the, something about like the kind of creativity in it all was where the wild things are. Um, there's something, um, you know, there's like something dark, but but beautiful and creative. And um, and I think that's like, yeah, I would say like one of the, the most the biggest like impacts I feel like I have had, like in terms of being a child and like reading a book uh, was where the wild things are. C asks or says, thank you, Ms. Copeland. I live through you. As a much younger girl, I taught myself ballet by reading books, renting from the library. Oh, I love that. I love that. Oh, I love it so much. You know, the like the library was such a safe haven for me. And I think because I was so shy and so introverted, that was like a space where I felt I could just be me. I, you know, I didn't have to speak. I, I could just dive into this creative space, and, um, you know, it, it's it's always been like a second home, whether it's a public library or whether it's in in my public schools. Um, so that's so beautiful to hear that. 
Uh, do you have plans to open your own ballet theater if you haven't already? I grew up in LA looking up to Debbie Allen. Dancing was my foundation. Oh, yeah. I look up to Debbie Allen, too. She was <laughs> she was one of my first mentors, actually. Um, I started dancing with her uh, school with Dada back when I was 15 years old. I was in her before it was called. It's, it's I think it's called the hot chocolate nutcracker now. I was in her original, the chocolate nutcracker. Um, but I, as as much as I adore that journey and Debbie and what she's done, um, I do not see myself opening up a ballet school or company. It is a ton of work. And um, and I think it takes a really special person to be a director of a, of a school or to be a teacher. Um, and I feel like I can bring value in different ways. I am starting my own foundation, which has not been launched, got, a, got some ways to go. But, you know, just to be able to, you know, have have a similar give children a similar experience as, as to what I had, you know, the, the opportunity to be exposed to an art form. Um, that is often not accessible to people in underserved communities. Um, that's really the intent behind the foundation is after school programming for under underserved communities and children. That's so beautiful, Miss Teeks. I know you're not just saying that you're like actually going to do it. <laughs> so that's it's happening amazing. right now. I'm in the midst of it all. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's amazing. Um, someone had just asked, do you have any pets? Uh, I do not have any pets. Um, you know, I would say the excuse, like I live in New York City, but like everyone has pets in New York City and they're like tiny apartments. I don't know how they do it. Um, I do not have any pets. <laughs> I got enough to take care of. <laughs> uh, this is from Sanam. A strong themes in your book, Life in Motion, is the support that you receive from mentors. How hard was it to find mentors as a young dancer in New York City? Did you seek them out or did they happen organic organically? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say both. Um, one of, I mean, of course, like I think about Elizabeth Cantine, who's here, um, who was an incredible mentor to me. I think about my first ballet teacher, Cynthia Bradley. But I would say the first mentor that really like sought me out um, is Victoria Rowell. She's an actress. She was, was in a big hit soap opera for many, many years. And um, she actually was a ballerina first and she danced for American Ballet Theater. She was in their junior company. She's a black woman. And um, she reached out to me when I was performing in L.A. and took me under her wing. And it was the first time I connected with uh, you know, that intimately with a black woman who had literally walked in my shoes, who had danced in the in ABT. Um, so there are instances like that, which, and I still have a relationship with Victoria to this day. And then there are people like, uh, Raven Wilkinson, whom my manager and I sought out. We, uh, we wanted to know if she was alive still and if like I could meet her and just be in her presence and learn everything about her. So, um, it's, it's a little bit of both. And I encourage young people to, to not be afraid to seek out, uh, that support and that help. But I think it's also important just to be open and ready for people to give you their love and support. <laughs> Tina asks, watching the Olympics, I see so much pressure on the athletes to perform. Do you think ballet can have a similar pressure? Oh, 100%. Um, you know, I think that one of the, one of the beauties though of, of, of of ballet is that, um, I mean, of course there are ballet competitions and things like that, but for the most part, when you're in a company, it's not about, it's not about that. It's not about being scored. Um, you're going on stage and it's about being in the moment and making adjustments to whatever is thrown at you, whether that's having a, a live orchestra and maybe having a conductor who's temperamental and is going to play a lot faster than you've ever rehearsed. Like all of those things that are thrown at you that are so beautiful, um, I think are like the, the things of ballet and, and performing that make it different from a sport. And, and that's what I really appreciate about, appreciate about what I do is that um, bringing the artistry in with the athleticism. But of course, there are pressures in different ways. There are pressures in different ways. And I think a lot of dancers would say it's the pressure within, you know, that they have that they put on themselves to be the best that they can be. And, 
And so, you know, that's again, why it's important to have a support system around you. Great. Um, maybe one more question. Um, I just had a question about the business side of it. You mentioned I'm um, your manager. Um, when did you in your professional career realize you needed people <laughs> to help you? You know, I never, I never thought I needed people in terms of the business side of things because it's not really a part of the ballet culture. Um, having like what my manager and I have built is not common at all in the ballet world. You know, I think that what we've built has really broken the mold as to what ba ballet dancers, sh you know, should be able to do. Um, you know, but Gilda kind of found me um, through my time. I was performing with Prince and um, and Gilda heard uh, she was like, how have I not how do I not know who this black ballerina is who's dancing at American Ballet Theater? Like, this is insane. I have to, I have to meet her and like learn more about her story. And, and then that's, we were, you know, introduced, but, um, you know, we, I've learned so much about having that type of support because I think a lot of dancers often just do this on their own. And if they do outside gigs outside of their company, they're the ones negotiating the money, the money and all of these things. And I think it's important to understand and dancers have this mentality is, you know, I'll do anything. I'll, I'll do it for free. I just want to work. And I think that we have to know our value and we have to hold people, you know, accountable that there are a lot of, there's a lot of funding and there's a lot of money that goes into so many parts of, of the arts, the performing arts. And I think that um, the, the artists on the stage should be compensated as well. Great. Well, thank you so much, Misty. This has been so much fun. I know. Thank you so, so much. I've, I've loved it. <laughs> yeah. And thanks for your time and for taking all our questions and being so great. This thank has just been amazing. Thank you. It was nice meeting you. And I'm glad that we had some of your people here <laughs> to represent. Thank you all so much for coming. More to come soon. Bye, Misty. Bye. All right. Um, that was so much fun, Angela. <laughs> um, I want to thank everyone um, at home for watching and um, for joining us today for the LA Made in Your Author program. And remember to check out the library's online calendar at lapl.org slash events. Also, don't forget to check out our next LA Made program Thursday, February 24th at 4 p.m., where we welcome Afro-Indigenous historian Kyle T. Mays, who explores current debates around the use of Native American imagery and the cultural appropriation of Black culture in his book, The Afro-Indigenous History of the United States. Mays will be joined in conversation with Amber Starks, an Afro-Indigenous advocate, educator, cultural critic, decolonial theorist, and budding abolitionist. Until next time, we truly appreciate all of your support, the success of LA Made, your author, and all of our library programs could not have happened without viewers like you. So thank you. Bye.